Today I'm going to give you uh, three key messages. And the first is why we think we're going to have the worst default cycle here in Australia since 91 and in the US since the GFC. The second key prediction is that we think uh, simple old risk-free cash, risk-free government bonds and near risk-free bank bonds are going to outperform equities over the next few years. And then finally, uh, we recommend avoiding illiquid assets like the plague. So the first challenge that I want to raise is we have an inflation crisis, and that inflation crisis is being driven by a productivity crisis. We have the worst productivity in decades. Labor productivity is running negative 3.5% year on year, and this is powering uh, a lot of inflation, as you'll discover in a moment. Uh, the problem is that productivity is measured as output per hour and businesses are carrying too many people for the products they're producing. This is manifesting globally very, very low unemployment rates. And you can also see it in the counterfactual. Think of Elon Musk waltzing into Twitter, sacking 80% of the workforce, but he still produces the same services. So this really poor productivity is showing up in super elevated unit wage costs. <clears throat> now, unit wage costs are what central banks use to forecast inflation the key forecast variable in their models. Here in Australia, they're running at about 7.5%, the highest level in decades, and we're seeing similar dynamics all over the world, in the US, Europe, and New Zealand. Now, <clears throat> unit wage costs are nominal wages, less productivity. And for the RBA to hit its 2 to 3% inflation target, these unit wage costs need to be down around 2.5%, not 7.5%. And there's no sign of any change. The only way to really change it is through a massive increase in unemployment. When we decompose Aussie inflation, uh, we find that the culprit is indeed these unit wage costs. So the key driver of inflation today in Australia is elevated wages coupled with uh, per persistently poor productivity, uh, and that's also showing up on the demand side of the inflation data. So if we look at demand side services inflation, in Australia, the US and Europe, we see all the same problems of sticky, stubborn, recalcitrant services inflation running at about 4 to 6 per cent a year, uh, and this is likely to power ongoing core inflation that will be multiples the central bank targets. Now, yes, we have had big increases in interest rates, and yes, we're seeing cracks starting to appear. But please note this. The RBA is not forecasting it will return to its 2.5 per cent inflation target until 2026, literally years away. And maybe one reason is because their cash rate's at 4.1 per cent, but they say the normal cash rate is 3.8. They do not have policy in restrictive territory according to their own modelling. They do in the US, uh, which is why we're seeing some of the stresses materialise in that economy. But another key fly in the ointment is when we shut down households and communities during the pandemic, we stopped them spending, right? At the same time, we gave them record amounts of cash. Uh, and this has led to something we've never seen before, these unprecedented consumer saving buffers. We estimate in Australia they're worth about 20% of annual income, and they are delaying the hiking cycle in terms of its impact on consumers and households, allowing them to resist the impact of rate hikes. Um, you can see, actually, this is Fed data. The green dotted line on this left-hand side is the Fed's measure of the Aussie consumer buffers, which are among the biggest in the world. Our data says, suggests the US... A uh, consumer will deplete their buffers uh, later this year. The Aussie consumer, however, will not deplete their buffers until um, uh, sometime late next year. Central banks are not going to cut rates aggressively. Markets think they, were, they will, but markets have been consistently wrong. Markets were pricing 100 basis points of cuts for the Fed this year, uh, and that's been eviscerated and shifted into next year. Because central banks are really concerned about repeating the mistakes of the 1970s when they cut rates um, too quickly, only to see inflation rebound very, very rapidly indeed. Now, these high interest rates, or so-called high discount rates, that are used to value, the value uh, all asset classes, so the, to price uh, equities, uh, property, venture capital and private equity, uh, pose a, a problem for their valuations. And when we look at cyclically adjusted price earnings multiples for the S&P 500 over the last 140 years, we're currently sitting at 31 times. The 140-year average is 17 times. The median is 15 times. So equity valuations look rich. And then when we analyse the relationship between core inflation and equities in the US, PE multiples are actually inversely correlated with uh, core inflation in the US. And at a 4 to 5% core inflation rate, US S&P 500 cyclically adjusted PE should be around 15 times. They're obviously north of 30 times, implying that inflation is not a problem, which we think it is. 
And then when we look at the forward returns from S&P 500 exposures, once the uh, PE multiple pierces 30 times, we find that they're demonstrably negative in every period, um, particularly when you adjust for inflation. So future returns from equities, once you reach these valuation heights, uh, look very, very unattractive. Another way about thinking about uh, equity valuations is using the equity risk premium model, looking at the extra return you get from equities above risk-free government bonds. And here, using the Fed's model, we find again that the return premium you get from equities over the risk-free rate is 25% smaller than it normally is, which again poses um, uh, real questions for valuations. We also have this tremendous uh, new innovation, the rise of these zombie companies. So 10 years ago, only about 5% of global listed companies were zombies. These are firms that don't have sufficient income to pay the interest on their debt. Uh, today, that's about 10 to 15% of all listed firms. And we're using FY22 data. If we were to market to market today, it'd be much worse because we've had much larger rate hikes since that time. But the cracks are already appearing. We're already seeing the emergence of the biggest default cycle in the US uh, since 2010. So bankruptcy filings year to date are the worst since 2010. Uh, and this is uh, very bad news for non-bank lenders in particular who are lending money to these uh, riskier borrowers. And we're seeing recovery rates on senior secured loans in the US drop to their uh, lowest levels ever. Normally these recovery rates are about 70 to 80 percent. Right now they're running at 25 percent year to date, probably because these non-bank lenders uh, extended money to companies on massively inflated valuations. Here in Australia we're seeing a huge increase in insolvencies. Uh, we're already back to 2016 levels. This has been driven by commercial real estate construction and residential property developers in particular. Uh, the key sectors focused on uh, by non-bank lenders. And then if we look at home loan delinquencies, um, between banks and non-banks. Uh, the top blue line is bank home loan uh, non-bank home, home loan delinquencies. The green line is uh, bank delinquencies. This is the 30-day arrears rate. We've seen a massive increase in uh, arrears amongst non-bank loans, but very little increase in the banks. Uh, and this really kind of uh, betrays the fact that a, a great deal of credit risk shifted out of the banking system after the 2008 crisis and went into the, the non-bank market. So the non-banks are holding most of the credit risk. Just to conclude, the, the existential challenge for uh, asset pricing today is these hurdle rates, these discount rates or, or risk-free rates. On risk-free government bonds, you can get 4 to 5% interest rates today. On cash deposits, you can get 5 to 6%. On relatively risk-free bank bonds, you can get 6 to 7% interest rates. And these are the new hurdle rates for all investments, which should be paying 3 to 5% risk premium or above them. And yet, if we look at A-grade office property, still yielding 4.5%, residential property yielding about 4%, um, if we look at Aussie equities, even grossed up for franking credits, yielding about 5.7%, which is just not enough. So our expectation is you're going to see onward, downward pressure uh, on asset prices uh, until they offer sufficiently high returns uh, above these hurdle rates. So in summary, we think the low rates for a long paradigm is dead. Uh, as is the search for yield. We can welcome the rise of attractive risk-free yield. We think we'll have the worst default cycle in Australia since the 91 recession, uh, and that cash and government and bank bonds will outperform equities over the next two, three, two to three years. And then finally, we think you should get short illiquidity, which you should avoid like the plague, and long liquidity uh, to benefit from the optionality that, that gives you to capitalise on future dislocations. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.